So significantly, something happened Monday. Of course, it was a uh, it was a an eclipse. Which, when we read in the Bible, it, this is the, when the Bible talks about the moon shall be turned to blood. There's a couple interesting things that we need to stay on course about knowing that God is speaking to us, and that sometimes when God speaks, that just because there's not a manifestation that, uh, of something uh, that we thought should happen or we're expecting does not mean that we are not on course that something is going to happen. First of all, let me, let me explain that in Genesis, when the Bible says that the sun and the moon and the stars were made for seasons and it was made for time and it was made for signs. Genesis, I uh, believe, uh, 1.14 declares that, and, and you need to stay on course about that because God intended, intended his whole, his whole thinking was to keep the feast, to keep the times and the seasons. Now, we celebrated, uh, we put it in order, we celebrated uh, Passover uh, two weeks ago, but Passover has not actually happened on the Jewish or biblical calendar. Now, it does not take away from our obedience, what we have done, and, and it came early, or Easter came early, or Passover came early, and we as Christians celebrated. Now, the celebration of Passover, according uh, to uh, the calendar of the Bible, will be in just a few weeks, and I believe it is the 26th or 27th, maybe somebody has the date, that uh, Passover will happen. But notice that the lunar, uh, the eclipse happened on the 8th of April, which happened to be the first day of the month in which Passover would take place. Now that is significant because God was always interested that any signs would always reflect his seasons and would, and would reflect especially his holy days. This is big to God. May not be big to you, may not be big to Israel, may not be big to the church, but it's big to God because the Bible speaks to us in Exodus concerning that the feast or these holy days are my feast. God says they are my feast. Everybody say my feast. He allows us to participate if we go into obedience in which he gives us instructions how we can enter into his feast. So it's not a Christian feast, it's not a, a Jewish feast, and uh, both cultures, those that believe in Christ, those that don't believe in this Christ, but is expecting as uh, the majority of Jewish people are expecting a Messiah to come, and we are believing in the Messiah that has come, which is Christ Jesus. When I am in Israel and talking to Jewish people who say, are you, I, I, say, I say to them, do you believe the Messiah has come? Do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? And, and they will say, uh, no, he was a good man, but there is one yet to come. And so instead of getting in an argument and debating and going through Isaiah and showing them all of the scriptures that, uh, that the manifestation of Jesus Christ is actually the Messiah, I always have taken a different turn in, in, in dialogue with uh, a Jewish person that does not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, I always tell him this, I always say, well, let me just tell you, according to your prophet, Isaiah, not my prophet, he's a Jewish prophet, according to him, he describes uh, a Jesus very, very well. So this is what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hang with Jesus until yours comes, and then I'll make some comparisons, and if he is greater than Jesus, then I might switch, but right now, He's alive and well in my heart. And Jesus is the Messiah as far as I am concerned biblically. So God has, God, God has uh, kept these feasts. He ordered his son Jesus to keep the feast. He, uh, he, he, he had his son die on one of the feast days. Not two weeks before, two weeks after. He died exactly on Passover. Passover is a season. Now, now stay with me here because I'm going to use this whale. I'm going to use signs. Everybody say signs. signs. Because he said I will speak to you in signs. He says that in, I believe, Genesis 1.14. 
they have that, if, if that's the right scripture verse, um, of, of, that he speaks to us. Here God said, let there be lights, firmaments of the heaven, divide the day from the night, and then let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. So God is, is saying, these are, uh, I, I made uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars, I, I made them for not only light, but I have made them to create time, to create a night, create a day. And he, and he specifically says, uh, they are for signs. And then he goes in and says, for seasons. And then he says, of course, days and years. So God is interested in speaking to us from the heavens. And he does it in many ways. He does it through the constellation. He does it through, he does it through the stars. He does it through the moon and through the sun. Now, when we read in, in, in many passages, uh, more than four or five passages where the moon turns to blood, that is a lunar, uh, that is an eclipse, excuse me, it's an eclipse. That's, that's exactly what it is uh, meaning when the moon turns to blood. And I know that in past, uh, uh, I've alluded to that the moon uh, has turned to blood since man has stepped on it because the only thing that um, is got blood in it is life, man or mammals or animals. But in fact, that the, the moon is, um, is red uh, when it goes through that uh, eclipse. So God, especially when you see the eclipse happening, you have to then say, when is he doing this? He did it on the first day of 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 the month, and remember there are two seasons in God. Uh, you that have been coming here long enough know that there are two seasons of God. There is a civil, a civil season, a civil brand new year, which is Rosh Hashanah, which is in the fall, which is the Jewish brand new year. But then at Passover is another season. There's a season there. So God has divided 12 months up in six months period. So he actually gives us a religious or he gives us a spiritual experience at Passover. You remember the Bible says in Joel 2, he says, I will pour out my spirit. And he talks about, uh, when he talks about the, the great outpouring, which is in the fall or at the atonement time or Feast of Tabernacles, he tells us, I will give you the former rain moderately and then I will give you the latter rain and then he says, I'll give you the former and the latter rain in the first month. Well, the first month on a civil calendar, on a Jewish calendar, is somewhere in between September and October. So what, what is Passover? What, what is it meant that the Passover is, um, is, is a new beginning or a new season? Well, God, God has said this will be the season in which I am going to bless you. I am going to moderately bless you. I am, I am preparing uh, this blessing. And then, and then this is when you then begin to read the scriptures and put it together where this is when God dispatches the angel. This is when God starts leading you for the next 12 months. And it's in a 12-month increments that the angel of the Lord comes to you and leads you, just like the angel did at Passover that night in which he went through, he divided the unbeliever from the believer, and the believer that had blood on the doorpost, they lived, or the firstborn lived, and those that did not believe, they, the firstborn was killed. That was the angel. Then that angel led the people out, or led God's people out. You are being led by an angel of the Lord. Angels are ministering spirits. The book of Psalms says angels have been given charged over us. Be careful what you say in your house. Be careful how you talk. Was your angel offended today the way you talked? What did you say today in conversation? Did you curse? Did you lie? Did you, did you watch something? Did you say something you shouldn't have said? Did you, what did you do? Your angel is right there. And your angel is holy. And there is the grace of God that keeps the angel there. But you're going to learn tonight that if you offend the Holy Spirit, there will be an exit of the angel of the Lord. And you're on your own. Hope you got good insurance. 
Hope your car will protect you. I was reading a story about Jerry uh, Lewis, the, the comedian, you know, in the 40s and 50s, and, and uh, he was very successful. He was a millionaire before he was 19 years old in the late 40s. It was, uh, it was, uh, it, it was a remarkable thing of his talent and his gift, Jerry Lewis. Uh, some of you on the latter end of his life would remember every Labor Day, he was a telethon. He was the king of telethons. He raised more money. He raised almost $2 billion dollars. In, in his telethon and ability for muscular dystrophy. And, and um, he, told, he tells the story, uh, uh, he tells the story that he ordered a car for his parents who his dad had never driven before. So he calls up General Motors and he tells them to make a special four door sedan car, but to, re, to build it in such a way that if they get in a wreck, they will not be hurt. So he spends $100,000 of protection of the car so that when his dad got in it, he loved his dad so much and his mother so much that, that it was like driving a tank down the street that if anything hit it, they would be protected. But that's the way God is with you. He builds your car to have protection. He builds your house to have protection. Other houses may have problems, but God is gonna prosper your house. God is gonna prosper your life. God is going to prosper your health. God is going to put things in your path. Anybody interested in God leading you? So this month, now follow closely. This month, he does the, he does the eclipse in the season in which he refers to, which we will say Passover. Now, if he did it in this month of Passover, he's speaking to us always. If something is being said to us. Do you know exactly what he's saying? No, I don't know exactly what he's saying, but we have the privilege of looking through a glass darkly. The Bible says that Paul said we look through a glass darkly and, 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 and Paul says we prophesy in part or we see in part. You see, if, if I was a, a, a person that had the prophetic gift and you could come up to me and I could tell you when the check was coming, when the healing was coming, when your break was coming, when the next job you're going to work at, what color car you're going to buy next and the house is going to be painted 10 years from now and that, and that this is going to happen and that was going to happen, I would be your God. And for all of you that are chasing prophets to try to find somebody to lay a hand on you, and some of you got so many spiritual dents on your heads, it's unbelievable, because you're seeking for some sign from some prophet to tell you something, and you will seek and seek and seek until you find somebody that will tickle your ear and say the right thing, and what you don't know, they're a, they're a witch, and they are disguised, and, and you're, they're under some kind of pattern, and what you don't know is they put a curse in you instead of a blessing. That's the reason why the Bible says lay hands suddenly on no man. And you're desperate for somebody to lay hands on you because you're so desperate because you can't hear from God. But if you walked with God and you had the Holy Spirit, you could, you could know God is, God is directing, God is, is speaking to you. So I never heard God's voice, neither have I. But the more I read the word of God, the more I'm understanding he's saying something to me, even though I look through a glass darkly and don't understand everything. And let me tell you something else you need to learn. God is not going to tell you verbally every single little thing to do because he's depending on you to walk by faith and not by sight. There are Christians that, are, that have had the Holy Spirit for 30 years that are still sucking bottles and, and their diapers are being changed and you have to burp them and baby them and if they don't get their way, they will pout and become manipulative and will try to prove to you that they are something because really they're not spiritual at all even though they think they're spiritual because they're gifted and they do great things that they overwhelm you because you obey them and you are addicted to the ovation instead of the presence of God. Because of the, more, the more presence of God you get, the more humbler you get. That's worth repeating. You can tweet that. The, 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 the humbler you get, the more you'll get close to God. God resists the proud. Resists the proud. 
but will heal the humble. He, he heals the humble. That's the reason why gifted people are very, very, uh, uh, people that have more than one talent uh, have more challenges and more temptations than anybody else. And if you only have one talent uh, and you work it, that's great, that's wonderful. But usually if, uh, if a person has uh, two or three talents, as in the case of the Bible, there was some that had five talents and some had four talents, one talent. And most people usually can't even handle one talent because they usually go and hide it and don't do nothing with it. And the people that got five are contending and trying to believe and, and they're accomplishing this and they're accomplishing that and they're accomplishing this and they're accomplishing that and they're, and they're doing this and there, there is, listen to this, there is fruit. The old saying is, how do I know I'm a leader? See if anybody's following. Da, 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 da. I'm a leader. Good, then turn around and see who's following. Are you leading in love? Are you leading in joy? Are you leading in discipline? Are you leading where people say, you save money, I can save money. You can buy a house, I can buy a house. You can have a job, I can have a job. You are prosperous, I want to be prosperous. I'm not following somebody who don't have any fruit. I'm not, I'm not talking about somebody that's got diarrhea of the mouth that tries to convince you of everything and says, I got this, I got that, and they don't have anything at all. I want to follow somebody, there's fruit. I'm going to stop and look at the house that's got five cars and wonder how did they get all those cars. He said, well, they're a sinner. And they don't. No, 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 no. But the, uh, wealth comes by the power of God. It doesn't, it doesn't come by the devil. devil. Devil would like for all of you to be broke. He would like for you to be discouraged. He wants you to have famine. He wants you to wake up. And let me just tell you, being broke and having no money uh, doesn't mean that you can be a very spiritual person. I've been in both situations. And when the poorer I was, the more I wanted to cuss. And the less I wanted to pray, and the less I wanted to have church. I know you're holy. But you, you, you put some progress in with God answering my prayer. And I begin to see things that begin to happen in my own life, not in somebody else's life. I begin to rejoice. I then begin to get, get addicted to the fact that God is blessing me and things are happening and... The Bible said you shall know them by their fruit and not by their gifts. Be careful with that. The wolves have lots of gifts. They will borrow from you and never pay you back. They will eat you out of your house. They will go to a restaurant and look at you straight eye and they will let you pay the bill not one time but all the time if you let them. You have to distinguish between the gifts and, 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 and the fruit thereof. So, so when God... When God begins to manifest things, there's going to be some fruit. There's going to be some manifestation. Even though that God is speaking to us like, well, nothing happened Monday, because I was telling everybody, and my neighbors were with me, uh, you know, the, my neighbors next door, they, we were all in the backyard. We are all looking at it. By the way, it was absolutely spectacular because we got these, uh, thank God, these glasses. I don't know how they make these glasses, but... Uh, we were all in the backyard. We were rejoicing. It was the most spectacular thing. I mean, didn't you, if anybody looked at it or anybody saw it or observed it, you just felt like, wow. And, and somebody says, there's no God. You could just kind of say, they got to be cuckoo. I mean, this is, this is just, just unbelievable. And I was telling everybody in the backyard, well, everybody hang on. There's an earthquake coming. And then Melody's over there saying, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that. Because there has been manifestations at times in history uh, uh, with that, or that this manifestation, that. But, but 
uh, if nothing happened, if nothing happened, then was God in that? Is God speaking to us? Or is it just a coincidence? Or is God, as we look back in history, we see those things happening. Why didn't God do that two weeks ago? Why, why was it in his month, at the Passover season, which is very important to him, so put, put it together with understanding the word of God that at Passover season is the season in which he dispatches an angel. We begin to believe that God is leading us and, and you, can, you can study for yourself what God said he would do in Exodus and we've studied that together and he would fight our enemies, he would heal the sick, he, he does... Uh, and I, I break it down in seven, uh, seven blessings, but there's actually more blessings that are being manifested and you can study it on yourself. I break it down just as simple as I can, but we know that that Passover season is a time, listen, is a time in which God has got something on his mind and that is to deliver his people. Yeah. And everybody shout a great big Amen. All the sequences of the, of the Passover, Jesus dying for us is about delivering us, is about giving us life, is about giving us heaven, all the way through from Egypt, deliverance out of Egypt, all the times that we go through uh, Passover, deliverance, uh, deliverance of Peter out of prison at Passover, deliverance of, of uh, Hezekiah, uh, who uh, uh, Jerusalem is besieged with 185,000 soldiers and the, the uh, king of Syria has already taken 48 cities and there are 49, uh, yeah, 48 cities, uh, give or take on uh, one of those cities there. So uh, I'm just trying to do this by memory, but uh, uh, history says he took, uh, I think, 48 cities. The, uh, the only city he didn't have in the whole Middle East, he'd take the Arab, Arabic world. He had taken Iran. He had taken, uh, now it would be Iran, uh, Turkey. And, and he had taken all of, 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 of up, up, up into Italy. And, and he, was, he was the emperor, much like uh, the Roman Empire under Caesar. And there was only one city he had not yet taken, which was Jerusalem. He brought 185,000 soldiers and surrounded Jerusalem. And it was a long time. It wasn't, just, it wasn't just for a few weeks. It was so long that Hezekiah was able to build a tunnel to some passageway to a water that when you and I go to the Holy Lands, I'll march you right through that passageway that was through a solid rock. No dirt. It's spellbinding to go through the Hezekiah waterway that Hezekiah had built an underground tunnel to get water to survive. And, and the 185,000 led by the king, Sennacherib, who, who, who could not figure why they weren't starving and why in those city walls they weren't dead by now. That's how many days he surrounded that city to starve them out. But if you happen to be God's people... Did you hear that, young man? Boy, didn't he pray good tonight? No weapon formed against me. You people that are God's people, you may not be perfect, but God's got something on his mind that you're going to be protected, you're going to be blessed, there is going to be deliverance. He's going to do something for his people. Oh, I'm going to get all of you to get excited about that. You need to believe that. But you don't know what I'm going through right now, Pastor. Get past what you're going through. What you're going through is nothing compared to what God's getting ready to do for you. I mean, this is a big thing, big thing. So, so it was Passover. It was Passover. Maybe they had an eclipse. Who knows? Maybe if you dig it out in, in, uh, in the scientific uh, uh, abilities of history, they, they may have an eclipse. But, but, but Hezekiah, Hezekiah, he's 33 years old, and, 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 and in the midst of that, he got sick. Anybody would get sick. If you knew that you were four times outnumbered, 
You only had 35,000 soldiers and they got 185,000 surrounded Jerusalem. He's already taken 48, 49 cities and he's now the emperor of the world. His last city is Jerusalem. I'd get sick too, I think. And for days and days and days and days and to drill, drill through that rock, uh, 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 they've got a timetable on that. So it wasn't just a week. It wasn't two, two weeks. It was a long period of time. But guess what happened? Passover came. Hezekiah, Isaiah, uh, when he went to pray for him, God said, he's going to die in three days. And, and this is the wrong time for a king to die because here is, um, and, and you should read the story. It is, it is mind-boggling because uh, King Sennacherib uh, sends Hezekiah a letter. Not only does he send Hezekiah a letter to tell him, I'm taking you down. I'm, 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 I'm going to burn your city. I'm gonna, and then has the nerve, listen to this, has the nerve to tell him, your God will not deliver you. And there's a lot of people in this generation in the United States of America that think just because they are getting by with what they are getting by with by breaking the law of God and nothing is happening, it's free will and baby, let's do it. And if you dare say something about it, they'll look at you and surround you like an enemy and say, well, you need to get an open mind. You need to get this and you need to get that. And you're standing alone saying, well, God don't like it, so I'm gonna stand on God's side. And they have the audacity to say, we don't care what God thinks. You take the homosexual, uh, the homosexual or the gay thing or uh, the thing that, that seems to be a big issue in our government to pass laws so that, so that you can get married. A man can get married to another man. Oh, I love the hair under your arms. You hairy-legged beast, I just can't take it anymore. I've got the hots for you. Jesus, have mercy. No wonder he walks like this to get attention like a woman so that another man can look at him. See, I can't help the way I walk. Well, you can take some walking classes. Or what? You... Come follow me around. I'll teach you how to walk like a man, talk like a man. Swallow some gravel. Get some gah in your... He said, well, Pastor, you need to take it easy. You're very rough on those kinds of people. I probably was. I probably need to be prayed for. But the bottom line is... Let's see, the, let's see what God thinks about that. You know what God thinks about it? I'll take you to the place. You won't be able to see it, but it's in the bottom, right before hell. It's in the bottom of the lowest place on the earth. He was so upset. He took his people out of there and his wife decided to turn around and look at it because she was a compromiser saying, you know, I kind of like that. And when the angels went to get Lot, the homosexuals wanted to have sex with the angels of God. Oh, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. You turn Netflix off, get in the Bible. This is the real stuff. I'm telling you, this is, it's all rated XXX. It's the real stuff. And the Bible said Sodom and Gomorrah was full of virgins and they couldn't even get a man to look at. She could take her clothes off and the man would say, no, Sarah, I want that hairy thing over there. <laughs> Somebody's laughing over there. They like that. They're just having a ball over there. They have every right to laugh. You know what God did? When he took Lot out of there, he sent angels to get out, and the men of the city wanted to have sex with the angels. Read it. And they got Lot out, and the Bible says that Lot's wife decided to look back, and God was so upset that anybody that, oh, this is, this is going to offend some of you. Anybody that even looks at it to even think that it's all right, God will turn you to a pillar of salt. You've never seen the vengeance of God. And then God buried that city. I'll take you right to it. It's in the bottom of the lowest place in the earth. It's in the bottom of the Dead Sea. Dead.
Dead Sea. You don't want to mess with God on that. You don't even play with that. And, and, and yet we want to minister to everyone that is that has a problem or with adultery or fornication even. You know, we, we pick on that same, but let me tell you, what about adultery and fornication? Get married, quit living with one another, get married. Well, we're trying this out. They say, no, no, get married. What's the matter? Don't you love her enough to say until death do us part? Or is she a used car or is he a used car to you? Oh, that didn't go over too well here. I hope we have a crowd here Sunday. I might be in a... <laughs> I'm trying to do it nice. I'm just trying to say... These are the things that God, uh, he, 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 he's not trying to keep us from uh, the good stuff of life that we think is good, which is sin. He's trying to help us so we won't die. The wages of sin is, does anybody know what the rest of it? Say, the wages of sin is what? Your Bible readers. That means if I do any kind of sin, my paycheck will be death. So when a man and woman lives together and say, hey, we're doing great, we're in love with each other, etc. Death is coming. Death is coming. You're doing something out of out of there. I didn't get, I didn't get caught. It's, man, I'm having a blast. I'm smoking marijuana. I'm having a couple women a week. My wife don't know, but I'm messing behind her back. I'm living good. Nobody's caught me. I'm in another city. I'm in another town. Got another bank account. Hey, nobody knows. You'll soon die. You'll die. I'm not talking about just that. You'll die. Something's going to happen. You're going to be exposed. You're, you, it, it's going to catch you. It's only for a little season. The Bible says that you only have sin for a season. Think think about that just for a moment. Sin has a time. Think about that. How much time do you think you're going to be able to commit adultery on your wife? What's the time limit on it? Six months? Three months? Two years? Well, there's a time on it. Enjoy it. Motel to motel, have the best time of your life. Go to Victoria's Secret every time you get a chance and buy her everything she wants. But she's not your wife. You have a wife. You're having a blast. And sin tells you it's wonderful, it's great, and you're having a wonderful time. Boy, sex is just wonderful. Oh, it's great. Then all of a sudden, death walks through the door and says, time's up. No more fun. No more fun. Sin is only for a season. That's what God said. And by the way, it's fun. It's exciting. It's challenging. Oh, look at all of y'all. I'm not saying nothing. Well, let, let, let. Let, let me, let me, let me kind of, let me let you off, or let everybody off the hook. We won't talk about that. Let's talk about cussing, just cussing somebody out. Just give them everything you want. It actually feels wonderful to say, I hate you. I can't stand you. You no good blankety blank, blank, blank. You actually feel good. Only for a little while. Only maybe about an hour, maybe 30 minutes, maybe two minutes, and it's over. It's a fact. So when God speaks to us and he says things that I am going to speak through, um, I'm going to speak. I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak. So... It is, in, it is in the month of Passover, meaning the big deal. Uh, let me go back to uh, the finish the story on, uh, on 
uh, Hezekiah, for you uh, need to know this, that when the, when the armies were surrounded, on the night of Passover, you'll read it, you'll find out not only did God heal Hezekiah, but the Bible said one, this is mind-boggling, one angel killed 185,000 soldiers in one night Less than eight hours. Figure it up yourself. The guy was, one angel was killing 50 and 60,000 every 30 minutes. They didn't all die at once. Think about it. And the Bible said King Shinaram came out of his tent and everything lay dead. Of course he packed up his bag and said, I'm getting out of here. And never did take Jerusalem and he never came back again. Now here's a man who said, your God will not deliver you. And Hezekiah takes it to the altar and says, God, you better read this letter. You read that part? Hezekiah, he was so shook up, he said, I'm taking this letter to the altar. The Bible said he took it to the temple and said, God, you read it. Have you ever done that with your prayer request? Lord, would you please read this? I'm three months back on my my home and I don't know what I'm gonna do and Lord, I've given my tithes and God, God, could you just please read it? Let me tell you, he can read. (laughs) So one place in the Bible, in Habakkuk uh, 2, 1, it says, write the vision or write the request or write the petition and write it so clear that you can run You can run by it and see it. Write your vision. Write your dream. Write what you believe. Write what's coming to you. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what is happening right now? Solar happened. It's all all going to pass. All the hopla. All the, everybody saw it. Everybody, what, what, Pastor? What what, what do you think is going to happen? Well, let me give you, let me give you a couple of, of, of pointers in the, in the word and try to steer you in the direction of your faith of what's going on. One, Passover. What's happened at Passover? He dispatches an angel. Uh, he delivers his people. Uh, there are great things that happen. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe this very strongly. I believe this very strongly. I believe something entered into the universe, into our world on the globe. And I don't know how to explain this, but there there is a a tremendous amount of income or blessings that are coming to his people. I believe that. Why do you say that? Well, because because there is provision at a a Passover season and, and and when you study Passover season, you will see God's deliverance. You will see God delivering his people. You will see much prosperity. For instance, uh, you, must follow, you must follow. Don't, don't shy away from Israel in the Old Testament for the New Testament. In Corinthians, the Bible says that God said, uh, look at them, watch them. How I dealt with them, how I dealt with them, I'm going to deal with you. They are example. For instance, God told those people to borrow money, gold, jewelry from the Egyptians. And here's the great thing about it. The Egyptians trusted them so much that they gave them the gold and they gave them the silver. And if you figure it all up, history says if you figure it all up, it was the paycheck of 394 years of rightful wages. That's how much gold and silver they took. Don't ever estimate, underestimate God. God gets even. You may think that you're, not, you're never going to get it back, but let me, let me tell you a scripture verse. The Bible said he will make the devil give it back to you double. He made Satan give Job back double. Who am I talking here tonight that God is pointing his finger right at you and you're in a season that God is going to give you or the devil's going to give you double. Not God, the devil. Not God, the devil. Well, the devil never did anything for me. Yeah, he stole from you. And God is going to make him. The Bible said if you've discovered the thief, you, you can demand seven times more back. 
In other words, if the devil has stole your joy, stole your health, stole your children, stole your money, stole your stuff, you have the right to say, give it back to me, devil. I've had cancer for six months and so now the Lord has healed me. Now you give me that, that health back, 12 months worth, that I had to go through all of that stuff and now I'm healed. Now devil, you're a liar. God did not give this sickness to me. Somebody said, well, I didn't know that. Learn to negotiate through God's word to the devil. The Bible teaches you, resist the devil. If I resist the devil, what does the Bible say in James 4? He'll flee from you. Quit drinking coffee with the devil. Quit cussing with the devil. Quit thinking like the devil thinks. Rise up and say, I resist this negativity. I resist what is happening to me. I resist this that's going on in my family. I resist, he will flee from you. The trouble is you won't open up your mouth and resist him. You're drinking with him. Pour me another Jack Bean. Resist him. That's what the Bible says. So we know that God is, this month, there is a, there is a huge deliverance coming for natural Israel as well as spiritual Israel. Something, and I know that uh, many of you watch Christian television and, and there are preachers, preachers, God bless their soul, I, I love every one of them. They're anxious for Jesus to come back because they haven't done anything. You send them money and they hadn't done a thing. They hadn't built a birdhouse. All they do is know how to write letters and get your money and tell you a sad story with flies in somebody's eyes and in the name of the gospel, you feel sorry. What are they doing? Where's their fruit? I can listen to somebody like Criflo or Dollar because he's got a church. He got a house full of people. I can listen to Bishop T.D. Jakes. I said, well, have you heard about him? Well, I'm not interested in hearing about him. I'm praying for him. I'm, I'm praying for every preacher. Everybody's going through hell. The trouble is we wait for our great men of God to fall and great women of God to fall because we haven't done anything in our life. We want them to be like us because we failed. We want them to fail. Go to hell. Lift up the word of the Lord. Lift up those that are in power. Well, pastor, what about your fruit? What about my fruit? When Jim Baker got out of prison, nobody would have him preach. The first place that Jim Baker preached was in our church. First place. And many people said, you better not have him. Well, what do you think I am? I'm the church. I'm not, I, I, I'm not an insane asylum. I'm a church. The church is for restoration. The church is to, is to recycle whatever's happened. It's to lift people up. I was the first one to have Jimmy Swagger come and preach. I was the first one to have Jimmy Swagger preach after he, after Playboy said what they did and everybody in. Oh, aren't you afraid of that? No, no, because you can pretty well tell if he has repented and people that don't repent. And some of you are saying, well, you ought to have some others. You know some others that they haven't repented. As soon as they repent, because they like what evidently they're going through, whatever. Anyway. So God is getting ready to deliver us. Now, let's, let's, 
let's, let's move very quickly to share with you so that the curse can be broken off of you. That actually, yes, Jesus broke all the curses. The Bible said he came and to, to fulfill the law and to break the curses that were under the law. And that's true. That's true when it comes to uh, him making us new creatures and, and we don't have to die for what we have done. There can be forgiveness. He can make a new creature out of us. There's, there's much truth to the grace of God um, confronting the law of God. And under the law, you died under the law of 4,000 years. It was lots of laws you didn't keep in there. You died under two, three women. Let me just give you one example. If a teenager, if a teenager, your teenager was having sex with another teenager at high school, and nowadays it's, uh, well, you need to use a condom so she won't get pregnant. And I might, I, I might know that there's some sexual activity going on with my children, but I don't know what to do about it. Let, let me... Let me help you understand what happened under the law for 4,000 years, that if anybody was caught in fornication, that meant your children or anybody, they then took your child, and the best way I can explain this is take them to the school's football field, surround them with the students with stones, and kill them right in front. See if woke will help you then. Now you're stoning and you're screaming because your 16-year-old daughter was caught having sex, whether she got caught pregnant or whatever. They're stoning her under the law, I'm talking about under the law, and they're killing her. Her teeth are being knocked out. She's dying right in front of your face because they caught her and they stoned her. This happened for 4,000 years under the law of Moses. Or adultery. Or if you got caught stealing. Or if you got caught not giving your tithes. Oh, you don't want me to go there. We'll, we'll back up. We're going to put this in reverse and go another lane here. Oh, back up. Let's move another way here. Now, guess what? Those teenagers that went to that school they didn't mess around. Don't touch me. I'm not going to be dragged down and be stoned. You see the difference? Let's compromise with capital punishment. And let's have more, more people in prison that you and I pay for taxes than we have in our public schools almost. There's no consequences. You tell me a young man at 19 years of age who says, I'm going to shoot a kid and says, all I'm going to get out of this is a judge throwing me into prison the rest of my life and they're going to feed me and, and I'm going to have free lunch the rest of my life. You tell that kid you kill another kid, we're going to fry you in the electric chair. He's going to think twice. But we've done away with that. We've done away with that. Until we all need to blame ourselves. We tolerate it. So when your kid dies, don't complain. You tolerated the laws. When you should stand up and say, that's not tolerant. Thou shalt not commit murder. Thou shalt not kill. I've only got 20% of you saying amen. Just because your relatives in prison and killed somebody don't make you shut up. You, you need to say for the next generation's sake to break this curse off of them. And I understand about the Justice Department and I understand about people who are wrongly done, et cetera, et cetera. I understand that. I think that's horrible. I don't like that. But there's some things that need to be taken care of, but there's no consequences anymore. 
No consequences if you commit abortion. No consequences if you commit fornication. There's no consequences if you commit adultery. There's no consequences if, uh, if, if, if they take your daughter or take your son and abuse them. You can't do anything but maybe get a lawsuit against them. Then they don't have anything. And under a lawless society, you have ravaging wolves that are destroying the fiber. And we're raising our kids in this. Oh, here's a big one. And we're printing money for us to make our kids pay a debt they'll never be able to get out of. And 52% of every dollar in America goes to the interest of the $32 trillion note we got right now. So the, the thing is, how can God turn this around? And he is. I want to give everybody good news. Something's getting ready to turn around. We've gone as far as we could go. Wouldn't you agree? It's, it's, it's time to get law back. It's time to be safe. It, it's time to bring the debt down. It's time for God to touch. Anybody agree with it? That's just good news. And of course, you're probably thinking I'm referring to the election and referring to who's going to be the next president. That, they, they can't do a thing. God bless, God bless all three of them. And I'm sure all three of them are, are good men. One's a president, one used to be a president, and one wants to be a president. And um, RFK, which, which you know, I admire. I like, I like Robert Kennedy. I do. I really do. I love his book. Um, but they're not the ones that's going to be able to change anything. It is the church and the people of God that understand what is going on. I gotta hurry, because I wanna show you this. So if you understand the times, and there's a scripture in Chronicles that the Bible says, uh, Issachar, the tribe of Issachar, there was a tribe among God's people called Issachar that understood the times to tell Israel what they should do. What I'm telling you tonight is understanding the times so you know what to do. So we know that it's Passover season and God's got something, something great's going to happen. I want you to note that whether it is, um, whether it is um, hype or whatever, I would, I would uh, slowly hesitate to make fun of the fact that the eclipse touched seven or eight cities called Nineveh, but some of the Ninevehs, they were, they were close to totality. But I, I didn't even know if there was a Nineveh, Texas. Where have I been? I didn't know that, I didn't even know that, I've lived in Indiana all my life. I did not know there was a Nineveh, Indiana. I didn't even know that at the crossing point where Right at the crossing point, I didn't know this. Right at the crossing point is considered Little Egypt. And there's a city there called Rapture. Uh, what, well, Pastor, that's just, come on. So I, I, I'm paying attention because oh, seven years ago it went through Satan. Seven Salem, Salem means Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was 50 years old seven years ago and was crowned as the capital, Jerusalem, of Israel, and that hadn't happened since King David. You don't, think, you don't have to worry about, well, that's no big deal, etc. That's a big deal. If you understand Bible prophecy, that's a big deal. So, so this goes through Nineveh. Here, 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 here. Look at this. I did not know. Look at there. Rapture, Indiana. Where in the world is that? It's right down there by the X area. Didn't know there was a Rapture, Indiana. Didn't know there was an Nineveh, Indiana. Didn't know there was an Nineveh, Ohio. Didn't know there was an Nineveh, Pennsylvania. Didn't know there was an Nineveh, New York. Didn't know there was an Nineveh, Nova Scotia. I didn't even know there was a place called Jacob, Texas, the entrance of totality of the 
eclipse that crossed over the border. I didn't know that. So, where do I read those names? Jacob, in the Bible. What's Nineveh? In the Bible. What's rapture? In the Bible. So if I'm going to pay attention to God saying there are signs, he doesn't just come out. He, he expects us to read. The, if you read the Bible, you would say, whoa. But if you don't read the Bible, you just don't know. So in ending here, to break the curse off, and tonight I want to tell you, you that have come here tonight, there's something going to be broken if it's not broken. And there is going to be a release of something that is going to be great in this season of your life. Tom, what's that scripture verse I asked you to uh, put up as, I think it was a Matthew? Matthew. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now, this is interesting to me. So we have to study Jonah. We have to study Jonah. Now, a couple of scripture verses up before this, Jesus cast out a demon out of a young man who throws himself in the water and in the fire. In other words, if he sees fire, he lunges toward it, and if they don't, if they don't catch him, he jumps in the fire and burns himself. And if he's around water, he, try, he jumps in the water and tries to drown himself. He's a, he's a demon possessed. And the Bible says, right up here in Matthew in the same chapter, that Jesus cast the demon out. Then they brought, 22nd verse, brought one possessed with the devil, blind, dumb, and healed in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And, up, and upward, my servant, uh, he, 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 he talks about, about this young man. Then he goes on to says, the Pharisees got upset and says, how can you cast out the devils? And, and Jesus knew their thoughts and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation. So he has that conversation. Then he says something here. He says something here. But if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. 29th verse. Or else how can one enter into the strong man's house? Listen, everybody. How can one? 29th verse. Here's Jesus talking. How can you walk into a strong man's house and spoil his good except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. What's he saying? If you do not bind the strong man and take authority in your house over your money, over your job, over your health, over your family, you must take authority. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin is blaspheming, and I shall for, it shall be forgiven in men. But the blaspheming against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whatsoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, nor in the world to come. And I know many people ask me, what is that sin? I will tell you the truth. I don't know, don't want to know, don't want to be tempted to know. And for you that know, you scare me. Because the Bible talks about the sin of ignorance. You ever read that? Not the sin of you know what's going on, but the sin of ignorance. I can get pretty close to explaining this, but I don't want to get too close, and I don't want you to know, because I don't ever want you to be tempted to the place that you have blasphemed the Holy Ghost, and you can't be saved. I will tell you this, just don't talk back to the Holy Spirit. Either make the tree of this fruit good or make uh, the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt for the tree is known by his fruit. Well, I guess I made that clear a while ago. O generation of vipers, how can you be an evil, oh listen to this, this is what we're going to break tonight, evil speak good things. For out of the heart, the, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. 
How can you curse and speak negativity and have good things happen to you? A good man out of the good treasures of his heart maketh forth good things, and an evil man out of evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. I, for I say unto you that every, now this is, this is what we're going to do tonight, next evening, everybody get ready. Every idle word. Every idle word. That men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified or by thy words you will be condemned. Listen, don't you dare point your finger at mama, daddy or somebody else or your old boss or somebody down the street or your ex-husband or your fifth wife or whatever. Let me tell you something. The reason why you're in the position you're in is because your words either justified you or you have been condemned. You can't blame nobody else. You can't blame the judge. You can't blame the Republicans, Democrats, Independents. You can't blame nobody but you. Where did those words come from? Those words came because you were in an environment of a of a generation before you that said you're negative, you're never gonna make anything and you're nothing to this and blame, blame this and blame that. And in the environment that got into your heart and now you keep it going in your family, you're never gonna make anything. You ought to get off on the blah, 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 when you should be saying, I'm gonna justify you. I, I don't understand why you're sitting there, but let me tell you, you're getting ready to be something. God's getting ready to do something. I'm telling you, there's a mere... Are, Have you ever ended your argument with your husband and wife? I don't, Melody and I, we don't do this enough. We should. Right in the heat of the argument. Well, let me give you a few thoughts that's coming out of my mouth right now. You're fixing to be more beautiful than you've ever been. I'm telling you, God's getting ready to bless you until I'm going to fall in love with you even though I can't stand the moment and the food and the, and the stuff you're doing and the spending and the credit cards. and the, the, but, but God is getting... I am either justifying or I am condemning. Some of you drove here with a conversation of condemning. All you can do is condemn, condemn, condemn. You condemn the White House. You condemn the Democrats. You condemn that. Why don't you start saying, in the name of Jesus, God's getting ready to do some changes. God is getting ready to turn this thing around. Devil, you're a liar. All of this sin and all of this mess, there's a great, where there is much, there, where there's sin, there's much more grace. Okay, I, I want to finish this. I really want to hang on those words right there. And then the religious people looked at Jesus and answered, Master, what, what, we should see a sign. He just told them. He just told them. Stupid. Now you want me to give you a sign and I just gave you the secret how to break the curse off of your life. It's your mouth. Life and death is in your tongue. So I'm up on this platform and Sherry Grisham has a heart attack right there. Winter and some others. Kim Jones, Sheila Muncy, Malachi, they get her in a wheelchair, wheel her down that aisle. They put her out in the hallway. I'm calling for my sister to honor her for, uh, on the night of the gala. And they said, she's gone. And I thought she took my mother home. My mother was right over here saying, I'm right here. Found out later that Sheila was out praying in the spirit, praying for Sheila, because she was dead. How long? Heartbeat came back. Winter is working. Another doctor, Kim Jones, is blowing in her mouth. She's a registered nurse. You got Dr. Sherman's right there taking over. You got Dr. Jameson. You have medical people that are around. They've cut her clothes off. I mean, they are going to work. Something's happening. Ambulance don't come till nine minutes. And so the heart stops once. They get it back again. 
It stops again, they get it back again. They get her in the ambulance and for nine minutes there is no beat. They get her in the hospital. When she's rolled in there and they hook her up, the line is flat, if you've ever seen one of those machines. So Kent is over here saying to me, Dad, uh, we better dismiss everybody, go back to the gala party. Tell them to go through the east door. Let nobody go in the back. Yeah, I'm up here. And I told everybody, let's pray, let's, let's stand, let's believe God. And so I directed people to go through these, uh, you know, a bunch of people in the balcony. We're all trying to get to the back. Nobody could go to the back because she's in the hallway and, and that, this is what's being told to me. Finally, uh, set, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes later, 12 minutes, everything's dismissed. And, and I walk off the stage. It's just, just right where I walk, I can tell you. And they came to me. I don't know who it was. She's dead. She's gone. Now, I'm thinking, now these are my pastor's friends, and they've come to my church. And minute, this is what came to my mind. My Lord, when the whole world finds out, that my pastor friends came to Family Christian Center. They'll tell everybody else, you better stay away from that place because you'll die if you go there. <laughs> That's the kind of thoughts that go through my mind. And in a, watch this, in a split second when that was said to me, whoever said it, I can't remember who said it, she's gone. I said, no, she's not. Now, while, I'm going I'm to show you something. I crossed over into a threshold and I wasn't coming back. Now, I'm, I'm talking about you want things to happen in your life. You got you to gotta step over into, I'm, you got to step over in somewhere you can't be distracted by any negative thing. It doesn't matter what the stock market does. It doesn't matter what the hospital says. It doesn't matter what the doctor says. It doesn't matter what they say. Now, you listen to me. If you have been trained to be negative, the first thing you're going to say, it's too bad. Oh, my God. Jesus, help us. But if you know that you can justify a situation, and the next verse says, Jesus talks about Jonah being in the whale. So that tells me that when the lunar sun took place and Jesus said, there'll be a sign, Jonah, Nineveh, 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 Nineveh. What's this got to do with us? There are four spots all of you are in tonight. One spot is you have ran from God's will. Bought you a ticket. Church to church. Person to person. And won't even come to church. You bought a ticket. Away for, from, from assembling yourselves. You hear me? In 40 days, there is a fish coming. It's going to swallow you up. And some of you are in that belly of the whale, or you're in a boat running, or You've been spit out. And that's not bad because you know, if you know anything about whale vomit, it's the most expensive thing, more expensive than gold, more expensive than silver. Did you know that? That whale vomit, they put in Chanel. If you have more Chanel to not, you have whale vomit on you. An expensive perfume you bought for 300 bucks or 200 bucks or maybe $39 or $16 at the Walgreens. There's some kind of whale puke in there. That's where they get the scent to last. Meaning that when God spits you out, even though you're stupid, when you should do what he says, he'll put you somewhere three days you feel like it's hell. But when the resurrection comes, he'll make you smell good all the way to Nineveh. So 
Some of you are either in the belly, you're in the storm, you've been puked out, you're headed for Nineveh. Now I'm going to give you a word of warning. You're not even happy when all of Nineveh is saved. You're mad that God turned Nineveh around and turned your situation around. And you're headed to pout underneath a tree. You haven't read the story of Jonah? Jesus is telling you about Jonah. I'm going to give you a sign. And when he was sitting underneath the tree, he was complaining because he wanted the Ninevehs to die. Just like some want people to die. Don't want them to be saved and delivered and all of that. And God saved you to deliver your brother, your sister, your next door neighbor down the street. God saved you to be a light to the world. Quit running from your calling. Change the world. Don't compromise with it. Change it. And the Bible said in the third day that Jonah got to worship in God. The only way and the only way that you're ever going to break the curse of your, curses out of your life, to break the negativity out of your mouth, is to worship. And the reason why the curses are upon you is you don't know how to worship. You can't lift your hands because the curses have kept you down. You can't clap your hands, you have no freedom. You can't sing, you say, but I'm not a good singer. God don't require good singing. He requires make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That's what he requires. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I got to finish. Now listen. Listen. You are on a boat. Or God is talking to you about you changing not just your family but a whole city. God is calling somebody to say Chicago is getting ready to repent. Chicago is getting ready to have a D.L. Moody revival. Chicago, look, look, anybody here, hear the sound of abundance of rain. So, how can you be so spiritual and reach 140,000 people who are gone, gone crazy there? And, and, and the sex situation in Nineveh was out of control. It was, they were so wicked, it's, I don't even want to talk about it. I mean, they were just, I mean, you talk about orgies, you talk about that, you talk about hubby, you, oh, you should read about Nineveh, it'd make, it, uh, it'd make you turn, uh, and you, you'd be embarrassed. Not enough pornography to tell you exactly what happened in the city of Nineveh. And one man who still, watch this, this is so amusing to me, and Jesus uses him and compares him like himself. As Jonah was in the well for three days, so shall the Son of Man be. <laughs> and I know he loves you, but he hates the sin you have. And it's a dual purpose to go to Nineveh and to tell them to repent, and they repent, and then you say, oh my God, I can't believe they obey God. And then go off and complain that what God told you happened. And you're singing the blues and depressed. Oh, read the last chapter, Jonah. That's exactly what happened. Then God smacked him up on the side of the face. And you never hear Jonah again, but let me tell you what happened to Jonah. He must have did great things. Why would Jesus compare himself to Jonah? So let me tell you what's, what's happening. Somewhere, somewhere, wherever you are in this moment of season, it's going to be remarkable. But there might be a couple of days you might be in the big fish. Don't worry. It's only three days. Jesus made that emphasis. I'm only going to be down there three days. 
which tells me that there is a tolerance you can take so much of death. That's another revelation. Let me show you. The exact time that we were having the eclipse, for all of you that think this is just circumstance, what's being said, uh, Tom, can you give us a picture of what was happening when the eclipse was taking place? You know, the whale. So in the stars, while the eclipse was taking place, there was a constellation of a whale or a large fish. The other side was Pisces. You can't make this up. There's a whale in the sky in constellation on one side of the moon. God must be speaking to us that none of us getting ready to repent. God must be telling us there's something huge about to happen in your neighborhood. God is telling us a miracle is going to happen and, and everybody is going to, it's going, it's going to be unbelievable. And not only that, the story has not yet been told. When he picked up that puke of that fish, he sold it and made plenty of money. Because it is the most expensive. All of you looking at me like I've lost my mind. Get your Google out, googie, 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 googie. And, and, and googie, 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 fish vomit. And it will tell you it's more expensive than gold and silver. That even when God deals with your rebellion, he makes you smell good after he pukes you out. But you won't be puked out until you start worshiping God and saying, oh God, I love you, Lord. I, I don't care what happens. I'm here now. Oh God, if you want to take me, take me. If you don't want to take me, I'm just going to serve you. Everybody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Say thank you, Jesus. I'll tell you that I'm right. In the next 75 days, there will be a world, world leader that will die. I don't know who it is, but he will die. Popular world leader. Let that be a sign. There's things that, that are going to happen that God is up to something gigantic with his people. Gigantic. I'm talking about worldwide. I'm not talking about America. I'm talking about worldwide. Something is shifting. And I'm going to tell you how, to, how you break what Jesus said. Jesus said, and, and let me, can I say something in closing? Listen to this very closely. And it's very scripture. So it's, it's actually in the same setting. And he talks about Jonah and he talks about the signs and he talks about, he talks about the moon. And he talks about the sun. He talks about the star. All this is in the setting. He says, when you resist the devil, when, you, when it's broken off of you, whether it is poverty tonight, that will be broken, whether it is uh, somebody cursed you, whether even though you're covered with the blood of Jesus, you keep speaking, cursing, negativity. How you doing? Well, I don't know, you know, things. Are, why do you say that? Uh, it's just a habit. Yes, it's in your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You're condemning yourself. You don't understand. My child is in jail and they got busted for drugs. Then start prophesying over that child and say, evidently that child must be of God or the devil would pick on my child. There must be some kind of anointing. That's what you look at. We do not fight flesh and blood. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood. So when I'm walking off here, I get to the office, precious bit. My mother's crying. She had a right to cry. Everybody in there. And they said, not only here, she's gone. 
I had stepped over a threshold until I had circulated and girded, as the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind in Romans 12. That I would not let my mind go there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm talking, this is how you break the thing. I said, my goodbyes, I can't go to the back. I wanted to. I wanted to celebrate with all the cast. I, 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 we had spent a lot of money. I wanted to be with them. I wanted to hug them. I wanted them. I, I did, we did that. Melody and I we did that. Spent a lot of money on the tent, everything, for, for the people who labor in the kingdom. In, in Jesus and it was good money spent. We don't complain about it. If I could all give them money, but we were, we were, we were dolling them up. We were lifting them up. We were just saying good words. I got to go. I gotta go. I prayed with. I found. I found in that room, Buck Treadway of agreement. Pastor, come in. Agree with me. I agree. Headed for the hospital. Marcus, you was there. I then. I want to go see her. Get me in there. Of course, I dedicated San uh, Francisco. I poured oil in the ground before it was Franciscan. So I feel like I own the place. Oh, let, 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 excuse me. I'm sorry, sisters. Sisters, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. And I, I mean that with reverence. I love because I love my Catholic brothers and sisters. I love them. So I, let me tell you how God was preparing me. Watch this. And he's doing the same thing to you. You better pay attention. So on Tuesday, I was really going through it. I mean, that was that Friday night. Jesus of Nazareth, we're in warfare spiritually. I know I'm going through it. My brain is just rattling. And usually when I am upset in warfare, I have to work. So I'm cleaning the garage. What? And I want everybody to feel bad that's watching me too. I do, I do. Because I'm not really in my right spirit. I'm in warfare. You know, when you're in warfare, you, you can friendly fire somebody. You don't mean to. I'm, I'm in warfare. Fi finally, I, I get my brains together, and I, uh, I think uh, somebody called me and said, can we use your car to pick up some guests that are coming to the game? I said, yeah. So I didn't have a car. And I kind of liked it. I kind of wanted to justify my negativity. So I'm going to walk home. It's three and a half miles to go home. But I can't walk down 45th Street because everybody stops. Hey, Pastor, can we give you a ride? <laughs> I've tried this many times. I can't do it. So I have to sneak. I have to go down the tracks. Well, this is true. I have to sneak. And still I got caught. And I went behind houses trying to get, you know, to where I live over there. Three and a half miles. Away. So I'm going down the tracks and I go to... Franciscan's Hospital on the, on the back side of the street. And something tells me, go in there and get blood. So I go in and I say to the girl, Can I, I'd like to get blood. Here I am in this warfare. I'm, I'm just going, I know the devil. I just know something, you know, just, anybody know what I'm talking about? Every one of you should have said, yeah, I know. Yeah. And so I thought, well, I'll give. That's, that's a good way to get out of my deal. And that's a, that's, giving is like worshiping, you know, you're, you give something, you, you, you can get out of that funk, you know. And they said, well, you can't do that here. We don't do that here anymore. And I, said, and I told the lady, I said, you mind if I, I just want to say a few prayers because I dedicated, I poured oil right about here. And she said, sure. So I prayed and I left. Unbeknownst to me. That Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night, I would be in the same place. That God was preparing something because you got to know that prayer is stacked upon prayer. It's a, each prayer is stacked upon another prayer. And uh, Acts 10 says it comes up as a memorial. So your prayers don't just lay aside. They stack on one another. And when I look back now, I see God had prepared for me no fear, have great authority. Walked in the emergency room. Let me in. Let's go, Mark. No stop. 
get back there. Watch that machine. Sherry! I had already crossed the threshold. I had already made up in my mind because we are justified by our words or we are condemned by our words. I looked at Mark, her husband. They're watching probably tonight. I said, she's going to be fine. They have a respirator up her mouth. They're pumping in her. But really, really, it's a, it's, it, it's a life machine trying to get her going. I said, Sherry, everything's going to be all right. What do you want me to say? Oh, darling, oh, God, Jesus, Jesus. Never walk into a room where somebody is dying and you join in with the criers. Walk in and say, this is a great day. When I walk into hospitals and they're dying, I blow everybody's mind because everybody in the room is just still waiting for death. And death is dancing around the bed, just having a great time. And everybody's just scared to death. And I walk in, well, this is a great day because the person that is still with us, even though they might be unconscious, their spirit is alive and well. And you know what Sherry Christian told me Sunday afternoon? Melody was sitting there. We left church, went there, spent three hours. Franciscan, now she's on the third floor. She's out. You know, the, you know, you know, the, her heart started going and God healed her. But you know, she told me, I heard you. I saw you. Now you, you listen to me. Listen to me. Or listen to the word of God. When you are in that supernatural position, there's only one that hears you. And that is God Almighty that you have captured. There are more for us than what is against us. And I played death words. I would have allowed the devil to walk in and dismiss Jesus. Get out of here. Nobody's in agreement with you. They're in agreement with me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you hearing the word of the Lord? I laid my hands on her. I prayed, said, you're going to be up. And You know, I'm not a doctor, but when that machine went off, beep. And I really didn't know what the bit was. I just knew it was a machine. There was a bunch of machines. Nurse runs in. What's going on? Beep! Beep! And the doctor said, from that moment on, the heart never stopped operating. Even though we had to go in and put stents because 90%. Oh, here's another thing. God had us to have the gala so she could have the heart attack here because she would have died at the mall in Houston, Texas. But because somebody justified the words of God. And I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about all of us. I'm happy to announce yesterday morning she got in a wheelchair and she rode United Airlines back to Texas and she is doing incredible. So whether I'm in that belly of problems, it's only going to last three days. Whether I'm trying to run, God's going to, and the Bible says, God prepared the fish to stop you. Then he vomits me out in smelling Chanel. Sends me to a place that's so corrupt. Listen to this. You know what they did to preachers in Nineveh? They filleted them. 
They took their skin and put it in trees outside the gates. So nobody would even think about telling them they were in sin. And he goes through there and somehow, by the way, let me tell you, there was a, an eclipse during the days of Nineveh for 40 days that uh, Jonah, while he was preaching, and it went dark and everybody freaked out. And so they listened to him and the Bible says the whole city repented. So you're either in Nineveh, maybe you're wondering why God's doing all that he's doing, but I got good news for you. The outcome of your situation is going to be so outstanding. Everybody say, with my mouth, I justify or I condemn. Okay, everybody prepare yourself. This is it. This is it. Are you ready? Are you ready? Get your mouth, lick, lick your lips. Everybody that wants every curse, everything that seems to be wobbling wherever you are in life, prepare for this moment that you are going to speak such resistance against all the negative words or any negative thing that you have thought, etc. You're going to break them at this very moment. And in this profession of your mouth, the devil is going to flee. But when he flees, he's going to take with him poverty, sickness, depression, rebellion, whatever, whatever you are going through. The Bible said that Jonah worshipped in the belly of the well. That would have been interesting how that he got. When I count to three, you are going to resist all forms of curses that's been cursed at you, lawsuits, whatever it's been coming against you. It's been the last 20 years, 10 years, 10 days, 10 minutes. Your children, everything. What you're going to do when I count to three, you're going to stand to your feet and you're going to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, every negative spirit leaves me now. And then you're going to, you're going to absolutely do what Jonah did. You're going to start worshiping and clapping like millions of dollars has been handed to you and God has done every miracle you've ever believed. When I count to three, you're going to stand up and loudly proclaim in the name of Jesus every negative word that has condemned me in the name of Jesus. And we ought to shout, Go! For, you know, Bible says, Resist the devil, he'll flee. Can you open those doors over there, please? Will you open those doors up over there, please? Ushers, would you please open up the back doors, please? There's going to be a wind coming here. Demons are going to fly out of this place like you have never seen. I like that. Look at that. They're, they're, they're opening the outer doors. Good for you. When I count to three, you're going to stand to your feet. You're going to say, in the name of Jesus, every negative word that has come out of my mouth that's condemned me. Go! If you have to say go three or four times and say the name of Jesus because the Bible says ask anything in my name and I will do it. Do it loud. Do it with authority and do not wait on anybody else to do it for you. Everybody buckle up your sword now. Adjust your armor. You're in the army of the Lord. The charge is about to be made. The declarations of kingdoms are standing by. Are you ready to cross the threshold? On the count of three, you will stand as loud as you can and you will say every condemned word that I've spoken. Go, go, go in the name of Jesus. Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils.
One, two, it's time to go to war. Three, I rebuke every negative word. Go!
Bible said that that which you just got rid of is going to get seven more and say, we're going back. I'm going back where these people got rid of me and you're going to help me. But the Bible said he will look for seven more demons to try to come back into you. But I got, don't take this offensive now. I got news for you, you demons. No weapon, I don't care what you say. It will not touch my life. Shout hallelujah. That means when cancer goes, the Bible said that a demon goes and gets seven other cancers. One, two, three, four. All right, let's go. They got rid of me, but we're all seven in me. We're going back. The minute, watch this, the minute they say a negative word, it gives us access. So let's get ready. Get ready. They're going to say it any minute. Yeah, they'll say it in the morning. They can't last that long, the negative men. They only last for a couple of hours. And wait for entrance. But if you walk in the word of the Lord, I will not. I declare, I declare, I declare, they cannot hinder you. Everybody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Anybody, anybody learn anything here tonight? Thank you. Anybody learn anything? So, so we're 30 minutes over, so we need to take an offering. How you feel about that? How you feel about that? And then sit down and write, do what you got to do in your offering. Come on. Balcony, ushers, go to work. You guys got to sing. And then I'm going to bless you. Sunday's going to be a great Sunday. Thank you for them getting me the whale. They, were, they had it halfway loaded up today. And they were hauling off across the parking lot. I said, no, 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 I want to use it. Thank you for helping me. If you need an envelope, you can give one. Raise your hand if you give them by cash and you want to make sure that you put in that. You got your phone? Got your phone. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Sorry, we're 30 minutes over, but... It's the week of the eclipse, so, you know, it's the signs and wonders time. Thank you for being a kind audience. Thank you for our youth. Thank you for all of them. All of you that are giving up, when you can do that, you, you know how to do that, don't you? And then all of you, and then all of you that gave the Passover. How many enjoyed the gift we gave you at the Passover offering? Big gift. Most expensive gift we ever gave. All of you that gave the Passover offering, you'll, you'll get a letter of, of, of agreement of what's happening. Thank you, Jesus. If you haven't given a Passover offering, it's the only offering in the Bible that you have 30 days to do it. It's the only, only offering in the Bible. You read in Numbers, God says, I'll give you another 30 days. I don't know what that's about, but we know that the Passover. So I want to say to everybody, this month's going to be very, very powerful because all of you have already prepared and you have already done and been obedient. There's going to be a lot of things happening in the next 40 days. 40 days from the eclipse. Let's watch it happen. I pray for that leader. I don't know who that leader is, but I pray. I hope, hope that don't happen, but we pray. I hope he's saved, whoever he is in the world. Everybody's giving right now. Everybody's giving. Everybody's giving. If you have given already, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet and let the Lord, let the Lord honor you. Let the Lord see your giving. Not the amount, but your generous heart. How many got something from the Lord? Say a great big amen. How many is glad you go to a balanced church? Not a ridiculous church, but a balanced church. I see many of you got the phones up in the air. 
God bless the people. Can't do this without the people giving. Lord, pay this building off. Speak to somebody to give $9 million. Pay it off. Help us, Lord, as we build on. I got a quote for the east side here. We're building on. And then the 475 foot frontage in the front, with three story glass that takes in the driving lane underneath the carport with brand new bathrooms. Bathrooms in which we will have to run people out. We'll hire people to run people out of these bathrooms. Marble floors. Many will want to sleep in the stalls. They're so good. Most of you won't go in our bathrooms now, but that's all the money I had. That's, that's all I could get. What you see now, then I'm not proud of them, but at least we can go to the bathroom. Hallelujah. But one day it's going to be better. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be nice. Box, box seats will go in. We will continue the progress. New platform. You'll see the new platform in just a few weeks. You know, all this is going to change. First time in 20 years. You're going to love the color. White, stone, beautiful. God's going to do great things. And he's going to do great things in your life. Everybody say, oh Lord, I give. Cheerfully. Guys, thank you so much. All of the phones, lift them up, lift them up in the balcony. Now, Father, I have given the word of the 40-day blessing. It is what I see the best of my ability. And Lord, let nobody make foolish decisions, but let them make decisions according to the word of the Lord. Let many be wealthy here in the next five years. Let wealth come to every person in this place. Let debts be paid off. Let there be a, an abundance. And all of you that got businesses and extra houses and cars, etc., you be blessed. And you that don't, get ready to have them. God is going to increase your wealth. God is going to heal you, deliver you. My prayer is, is that all of you will have abundance. And listen to Pastor. I, I can't explain what I'm seeing, but there is a transfer. Something happened Monday, and it has to do with wealth, and I really believe that God's people are getting ready to really benefit. So, and li li listen, listen. you you got to give your tithes. You can't, you, you can't play games. So honor God so that, that God will honor you. Now, everybody say, oh, Lord. Help my, Help my tongue. May I speak, May I speak words, words that justify me. That I speak words that justify my family. I speak words that justify my neighbors. I speak words that justify my nation. All the people here, in the name of Jesus. Now, everybody, we're going to have a little party here. That just simply means that all of you are going to turn around and say, I'm telling you, you can't believe what's going to happen to you. you got to say that to six or seven people. You ready? Go and do that. You guys can say, God bless you. See you Sunday. God, we believe. God, we believe. Very powerful what God did tonight. Probably one of the most powerful Wednesday nights I have ever experienced among the people. And I believe that you are too experienced in this. And I promised in the earlier part of coming to you that I would pray for you. And I believe strongly that this is for you too. Enter into agreement. Let those words that we pray, spirits go. They went. They went. God is adjusting. Something about the next 40 days, something about wherever you are in your life's journey. God's got you. You're headed. It's perfect will. I believe God's going to heal you, use you. Your 
are special people. Thank you for responding like the other people did. But leave with this. This is in all the 50 years that I've been in ministry, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen services. I've never seen the church. I've never seen anything like it. Of the people coming. It's a it's it's, it's remarkable. It must be the end time. God bless you. Be a part of us. Stay with us. We love you. We want you to be a part of this family, our extended family, wherever you might be. And in the name of Jesus, you will be blessed. And I sense really, really, really strong. It's 40 days. It's good things going to happen to you. God bless you. I'll see you Friday morning prayer or I'll see you Sunday. In Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to get everybody prepared. You know that um, uh, Pentecost Sunday is coming up. Not only that, Mother's Day is going to be in May. Also, also, there is going to be the big prayer meeting on Memorial Day, six o'clock in the morning. That's two of the most important prayer meetings. We have lots of prayer meetings, but those two, Memorial Day and Labor Day, are part of our culture at Family Christian Center where thousands meet and really we pray for God. The, the elements, the, the, the weather, the protection of our children, uh, that's coming up. Also, Camp Rain is coming up. That's where from five years of age to 12, you can go to camp, camp with us, and you'll hear more about that, where uh, your child can be a part of learning how to ride a horse, plant a garden, and goes to a week of activities that brings great joy. Then the teenagers and people who are wanting to intern, all of the parents, grandparents, every person, every student that wants to intern at Family Christian Center, it's an eight weeks course, it'll start in June. That means you can get involved in television, you can get involved in technology, lights, you can get involved in music, you can get involved in administration. You can get involved in any aspect of opportunity to intern, and that's going to be exciting. And that's coming up in June. Then there's going to be summer sizzle, and we are on our way. And then there's going to be May miracles on Wednesday night. So I wanted to tell you we are ready to go, and we already have the dates for Hotel Hallelujah in August. We also have the dates for Scrooge, the, the show dates, and already have the show dates for Jesus of Nazareth for 2025 the Lord Terry's. So lots of great things are happening. Hope to see you Sunday prayer, Friday mornings. Oh, God is up to something. And after tonight and after today service, you, you have felt where God is going to take us or take you in Jesus' name. Remember, great things are going to happen in your life. And remember, yes, you can.